prophet Isaiah strips us bare of our pretense, our hypocrisy, but doesn't leave us bare. Gives us the word of the clothing of God's mercy and grace. That by faith, when we turn, when we repent, when we humble ourselves before the Lord, we will always find welcome in the new beginning. And St. Paul says faith is the assurance of things hoped for. A few years ago, I was invited by Mother Dorothy to speak during the Rector's Forum on Food and Faith, and I shared this story, so some of you may be hearing it for the second time. There are parts of it that sound uh, unbelievable, but it's a true story. My good friend Chris went to seminary with him, Chris Smith. He planted a church Resurrection Presbyterian Church in South City, St. Louis, in a neighborhood called Dutchtown, a neighborhood that had been hollowed out and left empty. Not left empty. Full of folks forgotten about. So Chris and his congregation uh, they take over an old German Lutheran church building, small stone building, a simple sanctuary, a simple office building and church hall, separated by a courtyard that's about the size of one section of the pews, the half of the nave. And after a few months of being in the neighborhood, living in the neighborhood. Chris and his leadership at the church recognized they were in what some people call a food desert, usually not the people living there, but folks outside will label a neighborhood as a food desert. What that means is that the folks in the neighborhood did not have regular and easy access to healthy food options, fresh fruits and vegetables. The church had already set up a hunger relief ministry, a food pantry, and they decided that the courtyard between the two buildings didn't want to just be a lawn that was mowed, but instead they believed, wanted, and ought to be a garden that would help to provide healthy fruits and vegetables to complement and, and to supplement the, the hunger relief ministry, the food pantry. So they started the initiative, nine raised beds. They raised money to installed drip irrigation. I was there on a Saturday when they, were, when they were putting it in. By the second growing season, the second summer of this ministry, a few things had happened. <clears throat> One, they had collected about 2,000 pounds of produce for their food pantry from this plot of land. This, the second thing is that the, the garden became itself a, uh, a third space in the neighborhood, a safe space, uh, a place where they were able to build relationships with neighbors, folks who would come and work, folks who would come and eat, folks who would come and, and just hang out and talk. The other thing that the, the garden did is it exposed what often happens in parishes and churches, and that is that a small group of people got behind it, and after a couple of years, they were still the ones doing all the work. And that's fine. I mean, when you, when you commit to something, go in with both eyes open. You know, someone's like, I didn't sign up for this. I'm like, yes, you did. 
That is what you did. That core group of people worked incredibly hard, and others would volunteer as they were able. But that core group stayed together. At the lead of that core group was a lady in the church who invested so much of her time, so much of her personal resource, resources, so many of her personal resources, blood, sweat, and tears, to plan this, to lead this, to raise money, to organize the work days, to save the seeds, to order the seeds, all of it, harvest, okay? This was her mission. Okay, so <clears throat> here's, how this, here's, here's where the story turns. Chris said they all showed up on a Sunday morning to church. He was the first to arrive. And sometime during the night, someone had vandalized, that's not even the right word, destroyed this garden. All of the beds, all of the plants were pulled out. The drip irrig irrigation pulled out. The sides of the raised beds knocked down. The tools damaged. Everything about it had been vandalized. This was a really dark day, dark morning for this church. As they gathered and they grieved and lamented over what had happened, there was, of course, also a lot of anger, so much anger, understandably so. The lady who, the saint who had led this initiative was beside herself with anger. Felt so betrayed and so upset. And it didn't take long because it's a neighborhood ministry. It doesn't take long before folks find out who did it. It becomes an open secret in the neighborhood. And Chris was told the name of the young man, 14 years old, who had done this to the garden. This is somebody they knew. This is someone they had cared for. This is someone they had fed and loved. So the anger and the disappointment was severe. Uh, feelings of betrayal as well. When the manager of the project heard uh, who did it, she was so angry that um, it was wise for Chris to reach out to this young man and say, we'd like for you to stay away from the church for a little while for your own safety, I think, so that there can be time uh, to heal. When we're that angry, you know, we don't think that time will ever come, right? We which just be very difficult to forgive this person. The church moves on. And <clears throat> the kid, they loved him, you know, and Chris, I think, handled that in the best way he could, a difficult situation. But then here's what happened next. It's a Sunday morning, another Sunday. Uh, the church is small. It was hundred years ago it was built, and the side door, just like this door here, went right outside, right? So Chris is actually at the pulpit preaching, and the door opens, and that young man sticks his head in. And so the church did what you would do if that happened, and if I'd been on my A game, I would have cued somebody <laughs> to open that door. That would have been awesome. <laughs> they all looked, and um, he's 14. I, you know, I don't know if he forgot when church started, didn't know, didn't expect it to be full, didn't know what was going on. But at that point, he is seen, and Chris sees him, and everyone sees him. And so Chris says, hello, by name, it's okay, come on in. 
Well, he's embarrassed. What is he going to do? He's not going to. It's too awkward. He's going to come in, and he's going to sit in the first seat he can find, which is Sid, right where you're sitting. And he comes in, head down, and sits down. Well, Chris knew, and everyone else knew, that he had just sat down right next to the person who wanted to kill him. <laughs> True story. I said, Chris, you're putting me on. I said, no. Right there. And he said, also this, I knew I had left, uh, lost the room. I, I had lost it. Like, nobody cared about what I was about to say next. <laughs> they were all focused on what was happening right in front of them. So he wrapped up his sermon, and he said, he invited everyone to stand for a hymn before they would have communion. And he, he told me, he said, when we started singing, I was kind of afraid to look up, because I didn't know what was going to happen. But when I did look up, there they were. She was holding a hymn book, sharing with him, singing together, both crying. And Chris said, I started to cry. And then everyone else started to cry. And then we all went to the table together. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And I think what Jesus, one of the things that Jesus is trying to tell us today is that, of course, we have hopes that are tied to our security and our safety and our providing for our families. Of course, we have hopes for health and well-being, dependable transportation, friendships, But our hopes ought not to be limited by this earthly realm, the things of the earth. But rather, our hopes ought to hook into the hope that Isaiah commends to us, the hope that Indeed, in Christ, all things are being reconciled. The hope that our God can do far more abundantly, exceedingly, more than we could imagine or ask for or expect. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. May we come to that, have, have that kind of hope. And also, let that hope inspire in us faith in action. Amen.